You know, I don't have an art school background, unfortunately. I think it's a great thing if you can get it. But I didn't have it, so I figured, you know, from Warhol, I learned that what you see is what you get, kind of. And, um, and so I totally ripped off this book, On Road Schenko, for my first really famous research book. <laughs> and I will show you. I exactly copied the typeface, the column width, the letting, the way the, the uh, pull quotes were done. So that's funny that both of us have this Rodchenko debt. Um, <laughs> these black bars are totally ripped off from this book. Were you at that this. beef stroganoff dinner? Maybe. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? <laughs> I missed a reference. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah. But any, anyway, this. This book is a complete Rodchenko ripoff, and I happen to have it with me. <laughs> and you too can do something like this. <laughs> Emily, do you want to weigh in? Because I was sort of thinking you know, as maybe I, I don't know if um, yeah, it's a misperception. Say, but, uh, <laughs> that the collectives I sort of think of LTTR as being a group that somehow managed to work successfully together as a group. Yeah, um, I also feel like um, it was successful, which is really nice. You know, we're friends. Uh, the three of us started it, and then two more people came in, uh, Lanka Tattersall and Ulrika Muller. So we were three, five, and four um, over a six-year period, and um, we all did everything. We made all decisions by consensus. And mostly, uh, division of labor was it was it was casual. It was like, who's going to do this? I'll do it. It was no more formal than that. Um, we um, yeah, we did every we did the, everything from the call for submissions to the distribution ourselves, and um, and then uh, I think what's really important for me to mention is that when I think of LTTR as a collective, I don't only think of it as these, uh, this group of five names I just mentioned, but the other, you know, the 100 or sort of sometimes maybe 300 people who identified with the project and contributed to the project, people were, who were contributors. And the events um, that LTTR produced were crucial to uh, sort of the you know, the politics of the group and the, the, the spirit of the group. And all of that was um, volunteer labor all over the country. And um, people would fly themselves in to do performances and, um, you know, volunteer sound people and everything, all the design. And um, yeah, it was uh, it absolutely crucial to why I think the magazine um, became an uh, interesting cultural phenomenon. Why it mattered to all of us is because we were all um, we were all involved in a pretty equal level. And um, LTTR, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> um, well, it's not easy because I can say we're not working together right now. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> that speaks <laughs> volumes. <Yeah. laughs> but I, but I, I, I foregrounded that comment by saying we're friends. Um, true. We, um, it, things, we, you know, it's like things change, um, and yeah. uh, I, I don't want to stop things from changing, and I, um, and uh, we didn't, as a, as a group, we didn't want to institutionalize, which meant both in our friendships and um, professionally and sort of culturally, we didn't want to become like, um, we didn't want to be uh, institutionalized with everything that that implies. The, yeah, I once talked um, to somebody who might be in this room um, once about uh, how we made it work. And I think the thing about LTTR was, um, you know, there was a part of it that felt like, like an activist political project in the way that we, uh, we, it was a queer feminist journal. It was about identifying with a, like a, a sense of politics and, um, but it was no, in no way biologically determined. It was about um, it was about choosing to want to be a part of something and to be a part of this. And um, we all knew. I think we were all so connected with 
um, the ideas around the project, that the details of how it got done seemed effortless. I'm sorry if that seems <laughs> sort of unrealistic, but that's really how it felt for a while. And when I say a while, I'd say like the first four years. And that's, it's an incredible feeling. And um, I, yeah, I feel like with LTTR though, we weren't just working together, we were thinking together. And again, I don't mean three or five people, I mean this, a much larger group of people. We were, um, and that is, that's what drove us and that's what produced the magazine. Right. It's like band chemistry. I'm not saying yeah, that's an chemistry. obvious analogy, but yeah. um, Joe, do you, is SST was sort of run in a, as a group, right? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, and it's a kind of a, a good lesson in the, the limits of it because yeah. you start when you're young and you need other people to, you know, bounce. I mean, the ideas contend in a group that knows each other. And uh, probably the real, the, uh, the tragedy of rock and roll or the band model is that uh, you're not, you know, when you're 20, you're, uh, you're, that's what you're looking for. When you're 30, that's when, you know, bands break up and, you know, the guy who writes songs wants to do it his way. Right. He knows what he thinks about everything. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you get somebody hiring and firing backing musicians instead of what you're talking about, which is this interactive model. And so it's it's got a time fuse yeah. on it. That's age related, I would say. The other one thing, I, not in any way to augment, but something that your comments inspired is to say that um, and we spoke of this briefly before the panel, but it, I don't think it's bad to have a project that has a time frame. Like, to have a, a, a model that is perhaps limited, but that um, is productive. You know, so to say that something was this good for this long is still an incredible thing. And so if you don't, if you want to make something and you, um, you know, you set the boundaries of it, I think that's, a, an excellent way to proceed. I don't think that we always have to start things um, that are going to last forever. I mean, especially in, if this is about small press publishing, there's a certain amount of, you know, I right. mean, there's, there's, there's some longevity imaged on this panel, but, you know, all, it's also not always necessary. I'm good with that. I mean, it's, like a, it's kind of a classical model of like the the modernist like gesture in a magazine form to like mm -hmm. you know stake out an opposition create your thing um it doesn't have to take much money it doesn't have to last for that many years and then move on before the thing becomes kind of trenchant and that i was actually going to lead into a question about that unless there's i didn't uh, get around to everybody on the collectives i don't know if somebody really would like to comment you're welcome to before we Really quickly, sure. The bitterest pill that I had to swallow. <laughs> yeah, I want a bitter pill. Let's hear it. Um, I mean, not to swallow, but no. Know. It's just um, because A and B Quarterly is a collective. It's three of us, and right. it, and it, um, and we have a you know either everyone likes it or it doesn't run. There's no um, two out of three mm. kind of rule with A and B Quarterly. It's like everyone agrees or it just goes in the garbage, um, which is hard because sometimes you come in with things that you really yeah. love, right? And, if one person doesn't like it, it goes away, you know? And um, unfortunately, I mean, that's just the old way it Do happens. Do you lobby one another to avoid the veto moment? Well, we've... Mm, <laughs> yes. Yes. Things happen. Yeah, I yeah. Bet. Things, things happen, but... Um, and, and, and there have been some decisions based on that. Um, but at the beginning, um, you know, some of my co-editors <clears> were coming <throat> to the table with things that, um, that maybe I didn't think were good, you know? And, um, and I had to personally learned a very tough lesson about um, that just because I don't think something's good doesn't mean it's not good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and once the magazine started and went out into the world, I realized um, it was like an epiphany for me that like it was the, all of our energies coming together and all the different things that we're into coming together into one volume that made that magazine so successful. Right. And that if it was just me, it wouldn't be nearly as good 
as it was, as it as it has become with allowing everyone to kind of right. It's like more polychromatic. Yeah, and it was it was it was hard as a creative person with an aesthetic and ideas of what things should be to allow things to run through and understand why they need to run through for the greater success and the greater reach of the project. So then, has it become easier over time for the three of you to work together? Yeah, yeah well, that's very interesting. Much so. Very much so, because of that mutual respect that, you know, whatever this person is bringing, if they're passionate about it, right. you can kind of the recipe is sort of argument, then let it run. Yeah. You know? Like it's worked for you, you've seen yes. the yeah. reaction. But at the time, at the beginning, it was very difficult. I can't speak for them, but I know it was for them too. It was difficult for all of us to, to uh, let our e put our egos aside. Our right. aesthetics aside, um, in, you know, with the purpose of creating something that's better. Do you think there's something to having three? Is there sort of an ethos behind that? Like, it's sort of an interesting number, and in terms of like having um, a unanimity rather than majority, I think is probably really key. Like, if you had only done majority, you, it might because then more, it's yeah. two against one and. Mm -hmm. We, we started it. with three too, but yeah. but also I you know, I sort of part time sometimes working with the band right now, and um, they all say three is hard in a band, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe three is good. Well, well it's ha maybe it's yeah it's hard to introduce um you know unanimity as the rule with mm -hmm. a band right I mean <laughs> it's yeah. as a as an editorial <laughs> policy it's so absolutist that um it's I don't know did you come up with that right away to have that rule right away yeah. Right away, because of the three, because there were yeah. three, we knew that it, like somebody, it could quickly become. It's a human dynamics. You know? Right. It could quickly become two yeah. against one. And Brian, you work alone. Yeah, so. no, not collective at all. And even Solve when I like, that problem. I, yeah, when I invite someone else, I usually just put, you know give the full project to them, and you know if they need me, it's usually I'll like come roll a draft design or something. But then I'm totally under them. Right. Um, so yeah, no, it's a total individualist model. You don't have those challenges. Well, maybe I don't work well with others. Um, no, I, I recently did a, 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 I've always, I always like to collaborate. I always try, at least try to like to collaborate. Um, but most recently, like I did a, a three-person artist book with a uh, um, Chris Lepomi, an LA artist, and Darren Bader, a New York artist. And um, after a great deal of stalling, we finally divided the book into three parts, and then we got, it, we're able to finally do the book. But that's that's what it took. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Chapters. Um, uh, by the way, I don't have a clock, so Michael, will you let me know when we when I should? Okay. Oh yeah, it's 2:30. Well, I have more questions, or we can do that now. What? Um, and then, okay. Sure, I have many things to fill the awkward silence. Um, yes. <laughs> well, usually there's one person uh, behind any publication that somehow m gets the money and is responsible. And in, with all these people on the stage or podium, I mean, it's they all have their own arrangements, but. Usually one human has to be the bottom line responsible. I'm sorry, all this talk of collectivity aside. <laughs> well, I have to disagree. Um, we, we didn't have any money. We took our, the first uh, magazine, um, we printed in a publisher. I called him a year later. I was like, listen, we still don't have anything. And he was like, how you doing? You know, he knew we were never going to pay him back. We didn't have any money. Um, this girl, Whoa, an you know, angel. this girl came up to me one night in, in a club in New York and was like, "I don't look like a millionaire, but here's a thousand dollars." You know, Whew. and so like weird, weird things came and seriously, like weird things, weird things came in the first year. But also, we sold it ten dollars. We thought if a hundred people buy it for ten dollars, then maybe we can make another one. And so we we did it that way. And um, the last two issues, we got help, like in the form of grants. Or yeah, um, we got an emerging artist book grant from Printed Matter, and um, 
And then the fifth issue, I, essentially, I guess we had a publisher. Somebody covered the cost and then took half of the journals. So they took 500 journals to pay themselves back, and we took um, the other half. So, um, it was, yeah, so completely different model. We um, I was the inventor and creator of the liver haircut and uh, still am known today as Liverhead. <laughs> so I immediately became famous around the world. Uh, I shaved the bald stripe down my head and put a piece of beef liver down there <laughs> and taped it to my head with surgical tape. And uh, I wore it for about a month. Well, <laughs> the same Changing the liver, you know, every couple of days. <laughs> and uh, it got famous. It went around the world. I, people still call me Liverhead. But did that bring you money? Well, it brought, yes, all the, the you know, fame brings money. I just say, growing up in San Francisco, there was a man on, who rode the muni buses called Liver Man, and now I know who he was, but there really was. He had a piece of liver on his head. So you're not the only one. I wonder how much money he got for his magazine. <laughs> this is the late 70s and early 80s. Oh, yeah, he, he was riding right in there with me. They call that the zeitgeist. <laughs> Write that word down in your notebooks. Zeitgeist. <laughs> so lots of to talk about funding. Aaron, Aaron, you're funded in kind of a unique... Our magazine, yeah, we're very lucky. Can I ask, is it is it Ruka? Is that Ruka. how you say it? Okay, yeah. like Almond Roca. Yeah, like Almond Roca. Almond Roca. Uh, yeah, Ru Ruka, which is spelled R-V-C-A, is a... Um, is a clothing company that's based in Costa Mesa, California, and they, um, the guy, it's owned by a guy named Pat Tenori, um, who is a huge supporter of the arts on all levels, not just the publishing. Um, Artist Network Project was um, was begun as a, they also sponsor, they come out of street action, action sports culture, so they sponsor pro surfers and pro skateboarders and bands. But they also sponsor artists, and a and Artist Network Project was actually something that Pat started where artists were on a monthly stipend. Oh, wow. um, really? They were sponsored wow. like athletes. Um, and in, in, they would get a check every month. Not a big check, but a little check. You know? And was it people that he chose on yeah. his own? Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was a network. It was a lot of artist referral, you know, how it, how it happened. And then but in exchange for that, they had to provide designs for the company, <coughs> you know, like a two or three t-shirt designs every year. But then you get your monthly check on the first, you know, just to, you know, supporting. It's, it was small, but for a lot of the artists, especially in the beginning, it covered their rent or it covered their food for that week or whatever. And was he making a profit as he was doing this, or was this kind of the like company a is doing well? It wasn't doing that well. I mean, now yeah. it's grown considerably in the last few years. Um, at, at the beginning, it was kind of a gamble, but he's just that kind of person. And it was his idea to start the magazine, and he contacted myself, Ed Templeton, and Brendan Fowler to start the magazine, saying, "I want to do this. I want to get behind it. We'll pay the printing." Um, are you guys into it? So, and that's a very unique position. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no ad, I mean, there's a little logo and then masthead, you know, that shouts them out. There's not like a big clothing company ad on the back cover, right. which is sort of a model that's very mm -hmm. popular now. I know there's like Ac Acme, Acme Jeans. It's like a kind of a cool jeans label that does a magazine. A lot of clothing didn't companies Vans, do magazines. Like, like didn't Vans try to start a, didn't Vans try to start a magazine or something? Yeah, okay. and yeah, I think Levi's is starting one. I got a call about that recently, um, which is weird, but. They want to start like an underground magazine, um, uh, but it wasn't always the case. Yeah, <laughs> that wasn't always the case. I mean, I have, like you were saying, I I I probably owe fifty thousand dollars to printers around the world <laughs> that I just bailed. You know, I just print the book and disappear. Of things you were doing through Alleged. Yeah, yeah, before this project. Right. That's yeah, how I did it. So the key you know, is to um, <clears throat> to tell them to bill you. Just. <laughs> And give them Bruce's old address in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, do you um, want to? Yeah, I did it like a really straightforward way. I, um, lucky enough I, I, to teach, and teaching is something that, for what time you have to put into it, actually kind of pays nicely. 
Um, so when I was starting Second Cannons, um, I basically just took a couple heavy loads for a, a few terms and you know lived really cheaply and um, put that money into publishing. And I think I was lucky enough that uh, the money kept, kept coming back. So you know, so really my model is just you know, well I have money, I'll use it for publishing, and when I need more money, I'll work a little extra and, and throw money into there. But so far. Uh, things have been going pretty good. The project actually pays for itself to some degree. Yeah, degrees. yeah. Wow. You know, I just kind of raised enough for Upstart, and then uh, it's been kind of floating on its own for a little while now. I, you know, you never know how long it's going to last. And are you nonprofit? Are you? A, uh, it, well, did you file? Literally, yes. No, I'm not. Right. Um, but sure, no, no, I, I meant yeah. officially. No, uh, <laughs> no, just not officially at all. Um, and there's you know, a lot of work to do that. Not yeah, I like working. No, the oh, non-profit. Yeah, non yeah, no, that's totally, that's, that's actually why I don't, there's a lot, kind of a lot, of, a lot involved in doing going non-profit. I never felt worth it. Yeah. It just, you know, it's easier for me just to up my teaching load and make money that way. Right. So. Yeah, in order to get a lot of grants, you have to be, have an official non-profit status. And, um, you know, we never did that either. We, we identified more as an artist project and you don't, you know, you don't need a board. You already are collective, you know. Right. So that. Are there more questions from the from the audience? Yeah, yes. I feel very like the no covers are very seductive. I actually feel manipulated when I look at them because they're kind of irresistible. I want to know if you know what's going on. Like, are those? What is? <laughs> what is it about your no covers that are irresistible? What element is it that's that grabs people? <laughs> I designed the header, uh, unlike the LA Weekly, which just goes this big boring type across the top <laughs> that you can hardly read. I designed a little shape and a header, and uh, it says no, which automatically. Uh, makes it antisocial and then uh, along the bottom it would say something like sex music death garbage so that would uh, tend to indicate that um, you were going to find a certain type of quality inside <laughs> uh, some of the some of the issues we used uh, really beautiful women and uh, that did seduce people into opening up the pages and finding uh, the uh, unusual content. So it kind of went back and forth. Also, I'd like to say, if, um, I knew that guy was wearing liver in San Francisco. I would have <laughs> gone up there and hit him on the back of the head. <laughs> God, Bruce is the embodiment of the the personal. Is is uh, your publication or something? Are there any other Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, is this working? Okay. Um, what advice would you give to any students who are possibly looking into um, a print related job? You mean raising money or what? <laughs> no, no, just like um, getting started and I don't know. <laughs> I think most just, I mean, because that's a pretty broad question, most basically, I would say know who you want your audience to be hmm. and then work from there. I think I, I sorry I think it's the opposite that yeah. you should express your own obsessions after you figure out what they are you should really get passionate about something something you have to put into print and publication and then work from an inner spirit and drive that's me who was the uh, uh, the really ill man that wore the you did an issue on him. Burroughs, <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, 
He wore a, like a mask. He had trouble breathing. Bob Flanagan. Oh, Bob Flanagan. Yeah, you yeah. did a whole magazine on Bob Flanagan, which I thought was phenomenal. Nice. And That's my worst seller, but I don't care. <laughs> Emily, uh, you said that you um, you produce a thousand of your first publication, and I was just wondering, like, in terms of making a small amount, but you probably thought at the time that you know it was a lot, like, um, just how you distributed those, like, was there like a sentimental quality about it near the end, or like, just your experience with that? Yeah, well, we first thought we were going to make three hundred, and so. Um, when we were talked to the artists who were going to make multiples for the issue, we asked them to make 300, and then we realized it costs the same to off-print 1,000 as it does 300. So uh, we made 1,000, and that sort of surprised those people, because <laughs> that's upping their workload a lot. But um, we, uh, all the, the journals um, did have a lot of sort of handmade labor in them, uh, we collated them, and a lot of them have like sort of, you know, special things tuck, tucked into them that a machine doesn't do for you. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, they're mostly uh, gone, which was the idea. <laughs> but we we do um, try to put them in libraries and in um, um, places where people can look at them and stuff. But uh, yeah. I don't know if that's what you mean, but we weren't that precious about them in the beginning. You know, I'm not really sure, sure if we really are now either. But um, we didn't even we didn't make it for that reason. We wanted we made them um, so carefully because we wanted to treat people's art really well. That was the idea, not because we wanted them to be collectors items. It's any deal you can work out, I think. I mean, it helps if it, if you have face-to-face -face contact with a person or, you know, on a relatively friendly basis. But anything from consignment, I mean, it's obviously better financially if you can get paid up front. And the discounts are pretty high. They're usually at least 50%, you know, or more. But then, and then you can accept consignment, too. If, you just better count and never sing any money, but <laughs> you'll get used to that. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. It's just part of the game. I guess it's a game. So <laughs> somewhat. I know that I think um, for many years, printed matter couldn't buy anything from DAP because they were so in arrears that um, they just wouldn't distribute to them, so sure. that happens. But selling, going from store to store, like we did that with our first issue of Sub Targets, we just went to stores and then we had friends in different cities that went to stores and then it, it was kind of, I have to say, a cooler way of going about it than when DAP distributed us because then we just relied on being in a catalog among a bunch of other magazines and it was up to them, the buyers for the store, whether they wanted to carry it or not. Whereas when we were doing it ourselves, we knew the buyers at the stores and they felt emphatic about the journal and they would put it in a particular place and they wanted to know when the next one was coming out. And then we were just sort of part of this machinery. And I don't think we sold any more journals being distributed by a more legitimate distributor. So, and you know, and we don't have that much time. So there's, there, there aren't that many independent stores to go to. And it kind of is worth just going in there and then they'll say, you ask who the buyer is and what hours, um, you know, when it's a good time to come back and talk to them, and then either they'll take it on consignment or they'll give you the money. I don't know if other people have had similar experiences. The uh, uh, I, I wrote a little bit and did local distribution for Arthur, which was, you know, uh, maybe going for three and a half years yeah. and uh, still going online and maybe come back, but they took 
the drop model of free to coffee houses and uh, clubs and bookstores uh, with basically volunteer, you know, I mean, Jay, the, the uh, publisher, found people in every city they wanted to be in, and, and that person would hit, you know, the obvious places where right. people would go. And, is Arthur uh, no more? I just it's just a Christmas. It's not to me in that. print at the moment. Okay. So the new material is online and he sounds like they have a plan to get back into print. But they had thought about charging but you know the hassles of uh, uh, you know it, it, with me it's just me. I don't actually want to have uh, too many uh, you know, consignment invoices, and um, you can put 60 days on it. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. So it's it's safer to put it as a consignment. Then if they go out of business, the stock comes back to you. If it's a 60 day, you, you know, you'll get 10 cents or nothing out of the bankruptcy court. If, if you ever get into real numbers, which we did in the record business, uh, where you have, you know, hundreds of, of records on some warehouse shelf somewhere you can you can lose uh, a lot um, the difference between a consignment and a, and a and an invoice but you know it, it, so you you know you, you if you're starting you start um, probably organically where you are and and work from there you know. One more question from the audience. Someone's don't be shy. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, I used to work at a, a store in Los Angeles, a Skyline bookstore, and um, we actually do take consignment of zines. And Mr. Bill, what you actually said makes perfect sense. If you come on into the store and personally show your zine, I mean, we'll be happy to uh, have that consignment and bring it in. We actually have a wide. I think we're like one of the only independent bookstores that actually has a wide selection of zines. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the only way to do it is to. Yeah, your, your, your major friends that are in the bookstores, they're the only people that are actually going to carry the stuff. So that's why I say, you guys have a zine, please bring it over. And in fact, we have a table over there, oh, over outside, come on down. And we actually do a consignment, which is uh, we just bring one of your items and uh, drop it off. We'll take a look at it. Nine times out of ten, we'll actually carry it. So uh, that's that's a great option for you guys to come on and introduce your wonderful, strange, crazy wares to uh, the public. Uh, what's your name again? You got trampled. <laughs> Is that, are we wrapping it up then? Thanks to Michael and Eva for putting together a great program.